Welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone. My name is Tom Fodden and I uh, organise uh, the, the Grand Round programme. Um, thanks very much for coming today uh, and taking time out of uh, what is a busy time. For the last few weeks, we've been trying to get the digital strategy team to come along and speak, but for various reasons, mainly my frail immune system and being off, we've um, not managed to do it. But we're here today, so I'm pleased that um, Cliff Bartram and Alistair Graham are here to speak about the development of the Tayside digital strategy. And when they've done that, um, probably around quarter past, when uh, Dave Connolly is going to come and speak about the winter plan. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Cliff and Alistair. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'm Cliff Bartram. I'm a consultant anaesthetist in Tearside, and I'm also one of the digital clinical leads. So together with uh, Alistair Graham, who's the head of strategy delivery in the digital directorate, we're going to tell you something about NHS Tearside's uh, new exciting digital strategy that we're developing in conjunction with Deloitte. So what I'm hoping to tell you is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the vision, what it is that we're trying to achieve. And then I'm going to hand over to Alistair, who's going to go into a little bit more detail on the process behind it, how we're engaging with the organisation, and most importantly, how we're engaging with staff members, because we need you to help us shape and deliver the vision that we're about to describe. So this isn't just about putting in a new IT system, yet another, another thing like the, the, the new email. This is really a big process of change because it's not news to us as clinicians that we need access to patient information and information tools at the point of care. And those tools and, and those patient records need to follow the patient. So no matter the setting, those tools and that information has to be available. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us that paper just doesn't work for remote consultations and neither does it work particularly well on the wards and it definitely doesn't work when patients need to cross care settings. So we need to move to electronic systems. So I'm expecting as part of our digital vision that these two statements will hold true no matter what, what the care setting is, that I as a member of staff have access to the digital information tools and services that I need to fulfill my work wherever that may be. And access to those resources will help me provide the best care for my patients. So that's looking at things from a, from a, a clinician perspective. But what about the poor patient? because paper doesn't work for them either. Paper has been a tool that disempowers patients and leaves them in the dark about their own health care. And it presents barriers to them in terms of managing their own health. Um, and also it presents barriers for when they need information to cross uh, boundaries between health and social care. So we need to do better. And again, we need to move to electronic records and we need to look at giving patients the tools to interact with us in a digital way. So as a patient in NHS Tearside, I'd be looking for the digital strategy to ensure that I have access to the digital information tools and services that I need to help maintain and improve my health and well-being. And I expect my health and social care information to be captured electronically. I expect it to be integrated and shared securely to assist service staff and carers that need to see it. So we've got a complete um, joining up of systems and services based around the patient. It's basically moving the electronic patient record and tool set from very much a set of silo systems that are often um, organization or departmental based to something which envelops the, the patient with um, a sort of a digital, uh, set of tools for care and it moves with them. So it's a big plan and it's going to take, it's not something we're going to deliver tomorrow or even by Christmas. This is going to be a, a five-year plan and you can see this is more than just uh, uh, an, an IT project. 
The goal here is to reshape and transform the way we deliver services across the whole of Tayside. And we can only do that if we move to electronic records. And when we move to electronic records, we can start using some of the, some of the, of the real cool stuff like clinical decision support and artificial intelligence to help us in the care of our patients. But we have other foundations that we need to put in place before we can move that, well, move, move to, to those digital records. We have a major program of uh, infrastructure upgrade. We're looking at a multi-million pound upgrade program that, that is, is kicking off just now so that we're in a good position to be able to deliver that, that vision. And if we're able to deliver it, we'll get the, the, the quadruple aims that you see in, in, in front of us. So with electronic health records, we can actually measure what we're doing so we can improve outcomes. We can improve patients' experiences because we can now interact with them digitally and they can actually start to own some of their own healthcare and, and take on self-care as well. Good systems with information that follows the patient and systems that support patient care are gonna be good for staff. And one of the things which has been learned time and time again, particularly south of the border, when you've seen trusts that have been in financial difficulties is if you want to get out of financial difficulties, you don't do that by cutting in healthcare, you do it by driving up quality. And to drive up quality, you need to measure outcomes and you need to have electronic information so that your uh, staff can deliver the best possible care in the most efficient manner. So that's the vision in a nutshell. Um, it's going to be quite a journey to get there. So I'm going to hand over to Alistair now, who's going to take you through uh, some of the steps that are going to be required to deliver that. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Good afternoon, everybody. So yes, I'm Alistair here, I'm the Head of Digital Strategic Delivery. And, uh, um, you know, we've been starting the, the journey of this digital um, exploration, I suppose, from a strategy point of view for a number of months, um, and obviously it's predicated by history, of course, as well. So if we turn to the next slide, you will see the sort of approach that is underway, uh, and we'll continue really up until March. The intention of the plan is to March of next year. Um, so really at this stage, giving you early sight of, of process uh, and some of the outputs, but we'd certainly be keen if, if you felt it of use to come back and, and really present in detail some of the considerations, the focus areas, the strategic initiatives for you to comment uh, and remark on in terms of how that would support your, 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 your clinical work. Um, the process itself is really just to have an understanding of the current baseline and uh, there's been a number of external uh, audits of NHS Tayside's digital capability in the areas of readiness, in the areas of pathways, and, and indeed in leadership over the last 18 months to two years. So we're well informed about the baseline and how that is comparative to other boards uh, and indeed across the UK. Um, so, so with that baseline and the diagnosis, we then begin to look at the design and design stages, really to get a sense and a feel for what our ambition is digitally. Um, and always to be realistic within that. Um, as Cliff's mentioned, the, the strategy itself will span multiple years, but within that it will articulate what will be done in the first horizon, the short term, the first year, in the medium terms, years two to three, and, and then the longer term, three to five, and maybe even some of our aspirations beyond the five year mark as well. So this is very much set up to consider uh, how healthcare in Tayside will look in the future. As we move through the design and deploy stage, we obviously then need to consider and get into some of the difficult conversations, no doubt, but also challenging and rewarding conversations about what priorities we must stick to and must deliver in order to enable future stages. As Cliff has mentioned, and I'm sure of you, many of you have a, an individual view on, the infrastructure that these systems sit on needs investment and uh, the work to bring that investment forward from the organisation is ongoing. Um, we've seen some of this through the Windows 10 project, but also uh, in terms of what's necessary for networks, connectivity and, and other such work. So that, that's ongoing and, and we'll continue to link to the strategy development work. Um, and that deploy stage must also link into NHS Tayside's own strategic intent. Um, and the work of Deloitte is very much to look at the hooks necessary 
um, to really align that with the organization's uh, own requirements uh, within the, the strategic world. Um, so how are we doing this, Cliff? If you press that magic button, um, the work that we're engaged in just now is really looking at that diagnose, design, decide and deploy options. Um, so there's a core multidisciplinary uh, team that are coming together to consider that in detail. Um, it's representative of a range of clinical professions, uh, as well as support from corporate services, uh, and indeed colleagues in primary care and the health and social care partnerships uh, as, as we move through that work, really trying to consider the whole system. Um, as we go about that business, you'll notice the ongoing engagement with other side stakeholders. Um, so we have planned and delivered some specific interventions already in that pathway. Primary care leadership team um, and care board, um, some of the existing infrastructure there, uh, and also a strong session, session with our mental health colleagues just earlier in this week. Um, and that work will certainly continue, uh, and we would certainly be hopeful that um, through the grand round, we could include some further time with you um, once we're further developed um, to really put this plan and, and digital strategy under consideration and get your comments and views on priorities and approach and have we got the right domains within that. Um, so we continue to move this uh, through the remainder of this calendar year, uh, really to be able to talk then uh, for the following three months of, of next year in, in some content around the governance necessary to deliver that strategic ambition. Uh, and I suspect that's where the hard and difficult conversations will come but will be necessary to ensure for Tayside that we have a digital strategy that supports um, the clinical need, um, the, the care system and the requirements of our patients. Um, I think finally, as, as we draw this to a close, um, it's really a question then on the next slide, if you will, Cliff, of, of where we're looking. Um, and this is a bit of an example. Um, this is predicated around the mental health work, but really looking in detail about the patient experience and outcomes, uh, clinical and staff experience. Uh, and we're fortunate to have heard a lot about the sort of staff governance priorities in that area, uh, equity of access for both patients and staff, and, and, and the challenges that presents on digital platforms as well, and how that might be uh, mitigated. Uh, and then also looking at the operations and process side of things about um, I suppose what might be seen as an alternative approach where actually the, the, the technology supports an easing of operations and process rather than hindering, which may be some of the experience um, that has happened historically. So really keen to get those under uh, some consideration and, and looking at those through those lenses in terms of what it means for us. Um, the final slide um, that we have is really then in terms of next steps for us, Oh, sorry, Cliff, yeah, you're, just, you're right. Um, the next slide, really, about the operation, the opportunities, challenges, and priorities. So, really, within that process, really keen to hear from individual groups that we're meeting with what, what is the opportunity for digital uh, in supporting care and outcomes, um, recognizing the challenges that will prevent us from doing that and needing to be unlocked. Um, perhaps you won't be surprised to hear there's a lot of that being talked about, about the role the national teams are playing. Scottish Government, the national digital platforms, the once for Scotland aspiration, is that helping or hindering us in our own ambition locally? And then as we say, draw out those priorities. So hopefully the final clip this time, Cliff, um, really we continue our engagement with other stakeholders and we look to link that to other strategic activities going on, bring forward a strategy for consideration and vision and really be keen to put that under further scrutiny with this group uh, at a point uh, in the future. So I think that brings us to an end of, of just that introduction to the work that's going on. Um, Tom, I'm not sure if we've got time for questions, but happy to, to find some if that's necessary. And hopefully you will uh, see our intent to come back and speak in more detail as, as the plans develop. Thanks very much to both of you for that. Um, you know, I think that... Um, you know, this is very welcome and, and, and perhaps overdue. You, you look at, at colleagues in primary care who run a very, very paper light service and, and, um, and look at other centres around the country that are running paper free services. And, and I think we, we really look, need to 
embrace all this and, and crack on. I'm sat here surrounded by huge amounts of paperwork, of letters and results, and, and I think um, you know, I truly really welcome this. Does anyone have any questions from the audience? Um, if you put them in the chat or just unmute and say hello. Um, anything you want to ask? I, I, you, you mentioned in there about coming back to give us more updates. I hope that, the, 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 that we can get you back to Grand Rounds and, uh, and just give us regular updates on how things are going. I think people are genuinely interested in this and how, how it progresses. So maybe we'll just book you in for another slot in the new year and give us a, a more of an, uh, an update. No chat is forthcoming. So uh, I, I might say, Davis. can, I, oh, no, can I just, Jonathan? yeah, I, I think this is fantastic. I think um, the COVID has certainly um, bring, brought this to the, the, the forefront. Um, and from certainly from a neurological point of view, we were somewhat reticent in, in terms of embracing um, uh, this sort of platform. Now, my, 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 my only sort of concern at the moment is, is the clinical portal is, is, is rather limited. I, I suspect you realize that and, and having electronic notes on PDFs se seems to be rather limited. I, I presume there, there are plans afoot to, to, to improve that uh, and make it more user friendly. You know, we, we, we often have patients who's, whose history goes back 10, 15 years. And in, in the past, on, on, on a paper record, I, I could just look over it in, in, in two or three minutes. But, but now it would take, almost take an hour. Um, but, but, but that's my only gripe at, at the moment. I, I think the interaction of various platforms, you know, the, the ice is, 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 is better. Imaging is, is, is absolutely fantastic at the moment. And, and our ability to, 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 to view scans and, um, and things, I, I, I think has, has been revolutionized recently. But, but, but my only gripe at the moment is, is, is the big problem with, with clinical portal. Yeah, I think we, we, we take that on board, uh, Jonathan. There's, I mean, what we're looking at is, 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 is a completely new strategy. Uh, clinical portal, I think, has been a good stepping stone, uh, but I, I would view it as a stepping stone to a proper, fully integrated electronic patient record. That's where we need to, to, uh, to get to. There are limitations with uh, clinical portal's ability to be able to rapidly flick through old letters and so forth. I understand that there are better tools out there uh, that, that we could uh, deploy. Um, so it's a question of, of building in the best practice into whatever it is we, we, we put into, into our, our digital platform. I mean, what clinicians want and what patients want is we want one place we go to where we can do everything and it just works. And that, that, that's really what we need. No, I think it's very good. Uh, Patricia Burns in the chat has said uh, regarding research use of NHS data and ensuring that it's verifiable, will there be an easy access for the MHRA to audit their data? I know it's a problem in health boards in other areas, I think she said. Uh, again, I think, you know, the, the research side of things is something which has to be factored into the digital strategy. Um, and we also have to value our data. There's an awful lot of uh, NHS data, which is, I, I think is undervalued by the organization, which is, is incredibly valuable to, to, to researchers, um, both university-based and uh, commercial researchers. I think we need to be careful not to give our data away too cheaply. Uh, and we should definitely be looking for the NHS to get something back in return. Okay, I, mean, I, I echo uh, Jonathan's uh, point about flicking through portal um, and the lack of detail of, of searching. You know, you, you search for respiratory medicine, but that could be anything between a clinic, some pulmonary function tests, an outpatient review, uh, inpatient review. You know, it, it doesn't have that detail, and it takes it's, it's a, the flick through of the notes is a laborious task these days. Um, uh, uh, my colleague Andrew Gowdy has said, how will this be integrated with tertiary care letters, for example, letters from transplants services, Scottish Pulmonary Vascular Unit, etc. And I, I can add to that, you know, we get quite a lot of letters from out of the service and they come in paper form 
and I have one right here from the transplant center. How does that get into the digital notes? Do I have to scan this in myself and upload it? Yeah, and that's that's way of getting it in, and, and that's something digital is going to look at. I mean, there are um, plans to have a, a national digital record in the national digital platform. Um, so, you know, if assuming that that comes to fruition, we would very much plug into that. But yes, we're still going to get paper and we're going to have to have a way of consuming it. And at the moment, it's very difficult to get paper into portal, isn't it? So perhaps we, we will need to take on board uh, your know, legacy paper uh, communications coming through and we need to transform them into uh, digital communications and um, digital communications that we can search on as well, because th there are tools now that can actually search on text uh, to, to help with that flicking through the notes problem that we all have. Yeah, it's good to know that that's on your radar. Um, because it is something that, that uh, and I, I doubt we're the, the biggest um, uh, interactive with transplant services, et cetera, and out of, out of the board, but we certainly are heavy users and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge for us. Okay, if there's no more questions, then perhaps we'll just say thanks very much to the pair of you for, for your input and we'll see you again soon. And then Dave, are you there? Yes, you me Tom. Uh, so um, without further ado, um, although a little bit of ado, uh, winter is coming. Uh, and with it, it always brings uh, the challenges of increased low respiratory tract infections for, the, for us to deal with in respiratory and ID and the dreaded flu. So on the back of, of, of COVID being around, if COVID coincides with flu, then how are we going to manage? Um, uh, Dr. David Connell is one of my colleagues here in respiratory medicine and he for his sins is the clinical lead for winter planning in NHS Tayside. He's just hot footed it across from a meeting with the chief executive about winter planning so he will have the, the very most up-to-date plan of how we are going to cope this winter. Dave, thanks very much. Um, thanks Tom. <clears throat> As Tom said winter is coming of course I could you know preface every talk with a picture from Game of Thrones and some winter walker but I won't do that. That would be too obvious. My brother actually said I should have every slide should have a picture of a character from Game of Thrones apart from that very one. I haven't done that either. Um, so yeah, in January, actually you know, before January, I uh, agreed that I would take on some more winter planning time and then COVID happened, which is unfortunate for me, I suppose. Um, so and on that basis, I've been the clinical lead for winter planning, but working with a really good group of people in our core winter team planning group that I'll mention late, later on in the talk. But I suppose the first question is, um, uh, if I can get my screen to work there, um, is why is winter hard? I suppose that's the first question you've got to ask yourself. Why, why is winter always harder for us here in the NHS? And I think it's, it's because there's increased system demand. Now, I suppose most of the people on the call today are um, uh, hospital doctors. Um, and we always think that winter is really hard for us uh, in, in the hospital setting but it's hard across the piece it's hard in primary care and um, it's it's hard in our partnerships so we have to remember that and it's hard because of increased respiratory illness particularly influenza but also for our patients with airways disease um, increased rates of rhinovirus rsv metanumavirus will also drive them into the hospital and, and seeking help from general practitioners um, the frail elderly struggle in winter because it's it's harder to heat homes and we know if your home isn't heated or you're struggling to get to shops your health will be less good that follows on with orthopedic problems and um, where uh, slips trips and so on and um, can end up with patients on the orthopedic ward the weather is a challenge and we remember the beast from the east a few years ago um, and then finally um, staffing is a problem and um, as we'll see the staffing might well be a, a bigger problem this this winter so why will this winter uh, specifically be harder? Well, we'll have all those problems that I just mentioned, but in addition, uh, we'll have to manage surges of COVID-19 cases alongside influenza, all of which will present, broadly speaking, as influenza-like illnesses. There, will, there is persisting low population immunity uh, with, uh, at least before this wave, a 25% inpatient mortality to COVID-19. We know that dexamethasone um, reduces mortality. Uh, and in the, the people who need oxygen, the number needed to treat is about 30 and ventilated people, it's, it's, low, it's as low as eight or nine perhaps. But we know that this will put a particular pressure on our services. And because of COVID-19, we are using more AGPs and using more level two care than we would do in a normal flu season. And that puts additional pressure on us. 
Um, I suspect that we'll, you know, we'll see, again, different populations affected. So we know that, in, from our experience in previous years, that flu affects uh, lots of people with airways disease. And certainly people with airways disease do get COVID-19, but we know that people who get COVID-19 include people with cardiovascular disease um, and obesity and so on. So different populations are likely to be affected. All of this will be placed within a very challenging diagnostic capacity. And then we will have significant difficulty with planned care because of all these challenges. Now, this was a graph that um, we made in our winter planning team in May, trying, trying to show people how it might be difficult. And I think quite a lot of this is probably coming true now. So we thought there might be possible COVID admissions as lockdowns were eased and tightened through the summer. And certainly in Tayside, we saw a little bump in uh, July, August, with a, a small outbreak at the chicken uh, processing plant. We're seeing a, a wave now in autumn. And of course, Scottish government modelling suggests there will be a much more significant wave to come, not in December, but probably in January and February. But overlaid on top of this will be influenza and RSV. And we haven't seen a lot of RSV yet this year in the paediatric population. Um, but assuming that we do see um, a wave of influenza, RSV and other respiratory illnesses, these will all present on top of what may come with COVID, all presenting as undifferentiated influenza-like illness. And this will put a real pressure on our services. So a reasonable worst case scenario for the Nine Wells, Perth uh, front door, but also really impacting upon all our services across the organization could be a flu season like we saw in 2017-18, a concomitant COVID-19 surge. Difficulty identifying all patients coming to the hospital in unscheduled care with subsequent nosocomial transmission, and we have already seen that happening now. Increased demand of our unscheduled non-COVID care, and that would include uh, trauma care, orthopedic care, but also some of our planned or semi-urgent care in places like respiratory medicine or in surgery. And this would be in contrast to wave one where all of that really fell away. There's no expectation that that will happen this, this winter. We'll see staff shortages putting pressure on our rotors. And on top of this, we may or will see some degree of win winter weather. In wave one, we had seven weeks of um, kind of enhanced COVID activity. Um, I think we have to plan for probably double that this, this winter, starting in December, taking us through to March. So in order to do that, we've got a winter plan. And we've, what we've done is taken the winter plan we've used in previous years and, and really looked at it hard to see where we need to change things up. Um, and the scope of the plan is really whole system. It takes, us, uh, it takes the whole organization into account and, and there are these red boxes which is where the plan focuses and if anyone's really interested they can read it it's about 50 pages long and several thousand words long but it covers all these areas and i just want to say thank you to everyone who's who's helped uh, write it because many many people have have contributed so very briefly we've got to manage viral illnesses we've got to maintain our planned care and the safety of unscheduled care we have to analyze what what we're doing we need to provide an enhanced influenza vaccination program we need to provide some form of testing for COVID and flu. We need to have pathways to manage our patients who've got flu and COVID safely. We need to integrate this across our partnerships. We need to have uh, plans with resilience and uh, to manage our adverse weather and other things like EU exit, which is going to come in January. We need to have workforce planning, including festive rotas. And these are all things the Scottish Government wanted to make sure that we did. We've also added uh, some focus on mental health and paediatrics into our winter plan. So all of those big areas which we talk about in the winter plan are underpinned by our mantra of prevent, that's prevent illness and prevent admissions both in our population and our staff. Inform, so using data and triggers to understand what's happening and we'll talk about that later. Respond to that across the organisation and communicate importantly, not just to the press about what's happening, but to our staff and to our patients. So that's what the winter plan looks like. And as part of it, 1.5 million pounds has been agreed uh, by NHS TSA for winter and unscheduled funding, um, focusing in on the inform, as sorry, prevent, inform, respond, communicate mantras. And that um, includes you know, a really diverse set of projects, including uh, medical students helping in the acute medical unit um, to rapid uh, PCR testing for GI pathogens in our virology lab and so on. So it's a really diverse set of funds which underpin all those areas in, in the winter plan. How have we done it? So we've had six months of core group planning and, and the core group is myself, Susan Bean, Wendy Sign, and Kirsty Bownas. Um, but now supplemented by fortnightly and now weekly Pantayside uh, 
operational meetings, which includes everyone uh, from communications, partnerships, um, uh, people from acute services and so on. We've had multiple sub teams taking on various parts of the plan and, and a few of us sit in national planning groups as well, which has been really informative and helpful. I really wanted just to focus now on three key areas from the winter plan, just pluck them out and show you um, some areas that we think are going to be important this winter. And, and, and you'll be aware of them already. Um, and the first one is enhanced vaccination. And this has been uh, done by the uh, TVAC planning group chaired by uh, Danny Chandler, uh, Jane Forbes and Emma Fletcher. And this is to provide an enhanced influenza vaccination programme for patients and health and social care staff. And this started in September and has been going on, but they are already now planning also how they might deliver um, future COVID-19 vaccines, which may of course come available later on this year. Now, what, why, why is this important? Um, so we know that COVID-19 is, uh, impacted on uh, the most vulnerable in our society and impacts on people who would be recipients of the flu vaccine. We also know from data in wave one that this is from data from Public Health England and the COSIN database that co-infection with flu and COVID-19 increased mortality of, of either by three to five fold. So uh, taking a, a, a very serious pathogen like uh, SARS-CoV-2, having flu additionally appear to increase mortality very significantly. Um, and also keeping our staff healthy this winter is important. So we should vaccinate against the pathogens we were able to vaccinate. Um, so because of that, uh, we, the government and us in Tayside decided that um, we would have an enhanced flu vaccine program and extend it to more patient groups, more people than we would do normally, but also extend it to more staff, to um, social care workers as well as healthcare workers. And instead of aiming for 60% uh, vac vaccination rates, aim to maximize uptake up to 75%. So in previous years, uh, we've achieved 60% vaccination of about 13,000 staff. Now we want to achieve 75% uh, uptake rate of around 23,000 staff. And um, so we are looking to vaccinate many thousands of, of staff more than we have done in previous years. How is this going to be achieved or how, how is it being achieved? Um, there's significantly enhanced peer vaccination groups. So many hundreds more of our staff are vaccinating each other, which is good. And because of COVID-19, we've had to make sure there are COVID secure flu clinics. We aren't able to have the queues of people down the concourse that we've had in previous years. So they've worked hard to have a, a booking system and a recording system that allows that to be done. Now, the good news is, I'll just share this box with you here, that it's working. So in previous years, we've never vaccinated um, across the whole winter more than 7,000 staff. And these data are already a week old. We are, I, I understand it from Emma and, uh, Fletcher and Public Health, um, getting towards 9,000 staff, uh, both healthcare workers and social care workers, uh, vaccinated, which is an incredible number. So that's you know already a uh, nearly a 50% increase from our best um, effort in previous years. And we're, I think, already at 60%, so breaching our previous vaccine uptake targets. Now we need to get to 75%. And I would encourage everyone to champion the flu vaccination in their area, raise awareness of how serious flu can be, challenge the inevitable myths. Um, flu is not a live vaccine, it doesn't give you flu. Um, and keep the agenda about vaccination high. Um, of course, later in this year um, or next year, we'll start talking about the vaccines for COVID-19, but it, it is going to be incredibly important that people do get their flu vaccine. The second thing I wanted to talk about was rapid and safe identification and management of influenza-like illnesses. Um, this is really, really important. We're, we're likely to see a very significant um, number of patients seeking medical attention through uh, NHS 24, their general practitioners, emergency departments, and, uh, and the acute medicine service uh, this, this winter with influenza-like illnesses. Some of those people will have flu, some will have COVID-19, some will have neither but we need to be able to um, safely assess them. So the assessment centres that were um, made in wave one are being remobilised across Tayside in primary and secondary care. And certainly in Angus, there is a kind of a collapsible hierarchy of assessment centres starting at the CAC at King's Cross and spreading out as, as the demand requires. This will uh, utilise some rapid patient testing, which we'll tell you about in a second, and allow hopefully the safe coordinated management of COVID-19 and influenza this, this winter. Now, this is what we did in, in wave one. So if someone needs an unscheduled assessment in NHS Tayside who had possible COVID-19 um, and needed to 
be assessed in hospital, there would be a dedicated line with a professional to professional assessment. And according to HPS criteria, we might uh, triage people as probable or possible COVID-19 and see them um, on Ward 42 or the East Block Assessment Area, swab them, and that swab uh, would take several hours, and then transfer them into positive cohort areas, indeterminate cohort areas, or negative areas. Separately, patients who were felt to be unlikely to have COVID-19 uh, would go to places like AMU or PRI, have a variable swab uh, for COVID-19, um, some would, some wouldn't, and then be transferred on. And then, of course, there would be a number of patients who were unswabbed and unknown. And I think 10% of all of our cases of COVID-19 came through that pathway. And that we can't do uh, this winter. It's, it's not going to be possible to have um, patients who are effectively unknown um, moving through a AMUs. We, we, we need to be absolutely sure where, where we're placing patients, given the likely increased prevalence or ongoing increased prevalence of COVID-19 this, this winter, but also the increased presentations with influenza-like illnesses. And that's how we would do it. So outside the traditional hospital or inside the traditional hospital. So as we were making our winter plan of how we might try and tackle some of this, the Scottish Government in midsummer um, put out a, a, a request at short notice for all Scottish uh, health boards to redesign their urgent care. And uh, Ron Cook and his team had already been working on this so we used this opportunity to try and take what the government wanted, what we thought would be important for winter, and what Ron Cook and the reshaping Ur urgent care team thought um, would be useful to try and really tackle how we deal with unscheduled admissions this winter and then, and then beyond. So to do that, we're starting to generate pathways. And the key mantra will be that we want to try and schedule as much unscheduled care as possible this, this winter. Now, um, as part of this, uh, the ED department are going to have a navigation flow hub, and this sort of sits in, in the middle here, where there will be people with dedicated time in the job plan um, able to stream patients um, to scheduled parts of what might be otherwise seen to be unscheduled care. So using hot clinics, bringing patients to ED in a planned way so that we will reduce overcrowding in our um, unscheduled uh, care departments, but also get patients to the right place at, at the right time without having to come through an emergency department first. As part of that, we're going to be taking patients who are likely to have COVID-19 and moving them to the right area where possible and using rapid or urgent viral testing uh, to confirm or refute di diagnoses as quickly as possible. And as part of that, using our COVID-19 community assessment centre at King's Cross and other locality hubs to do that. As I said, the key middle part of all of this is the um, navigation flow hub, which we'll be hoping to start from early December, staffed by ED physicians. But um, what we're going to do is generate a series of pathways which exist across Tayside now, but are, are possibly not written down or formalised. Come to services, say, look, how do you get patients into your service? How can we access them in a sensible way so patients aren't coming through EDs uh, with things like pleural effusions that, 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 that don't need admitting or headaches that, that don't need admitting but could be seen more quickly in services. And that's going to be some of our work to be done over the next few weeks in preparation for winter. As part of this, it's going to be important to be able to rapidly diagnose people with influenza and SARS-CoV-2. So a, a huge amount of work has been done through James Cotton's uh, testing group over the last few months, and I'll share some of that now. Um, early on, um, the UK government and Scottish government have, have been, uh, you'll have seen the news, lots of stories about we're going to have this test or that test. And there's a very Byzantine series of committees across the United Kingdom that are testing or discussing uh, what might be possible. And, and the reality is that none of this is, is coming at a pace that the NHS really needs for this winter. So on that basis, we at NHS Tayside have tried to uh, be led by what we feel to be the right thing to do. Um, and to use what we've done in the past in terms of rapid testing for influenza to guide our, our planning. So the first thing that was uh, planned through a series of options appraisals was a, a hot lab that would be operational by Halloween, and we were able to do that. Now, this gives us uh, the Kefid uh, Gene Expert platform. This has been a platform that can diagnose TB rapidly, but also things like MRSA and some GI pathogens. Um, and it's been um, switched to be able to diagnose SARS-CoV-2. Um, we had our hot lab operational uh, for, for about two and a half weeks now, I think, it's able to diagnose SARS-CoV-2 
to in around 90 minutes from getting the sample getting to the lab. Um, we hope to be able to do um, over 100 tests a day, but again, the Scottish Government has very much restricted the number of tests coming to health boards. So we've been restricted at approximately 20 tests a day, although we have actually only had to use, I think, up to five or six a day at, at, at most. Um, this will take us up until the start of December, where we move to our next phase in time for winter, which is 24-7 rapid testing for uh, now both pathogens, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. This is using a different platform, the Liat Roche, which we've used for influenza in previous years. The exact timing will depend on the validation uh, availability of kits and staffing, but we're aiming for the 1st of December. The Scottish Government has given us our allocation of kits. We hope that will be sufficient to get us through enough rapid tests per day through this winter. Um, and shortly we will be coming back to clinical teams um, to discuss who gets a rapid test, who gets an urgent test, which might be a test within four or five hours, and who would get a routine test within 24 hours. And there will be bespoke uh, requests are nice for each of those things and bespoke processes for getting these samples to the lab and results back to teams. So that's uh, an update on rapid testing for influenza and SARS-CoV-2 this winter. We hope it will be, or it will be a, a, a key part of our plan. The final thing I wanted to mention was how we coordinate our responses this winter. And um, as part of our early planning, we, you know, we feel that this is, this has to be really looked upon as a slow burn major incident lasting weeks and weeks and weeks. And part of that is really getting the data to understand how we respond to the pressures on our system. And not just in the hospital, as I say, across the whole of NHS Tayside. Now, all of us uh, are used to taking an observation from a patient, um, getting a score, deciding how well the patient is and, and having an action. And I think what we need to do is look upon our organization as an organism and um, do the same kind of process. So to do that, we spent a lot of time uh, with the business unit, with Sarah Lowry and Jenny Woods, to try and get the kind of data, the, the temperature, the blood pressure equivalents, if you will, of NHS Tayside to get a uh, equivalent of a new score. What, we, what our, our plan is to take data, analyze it, come up with a threat or activity level, have an action, and then monitor our response, but do that at a strategic hospital and organizational wide level. What we'll do is take data from public health, COVID inpatient activity, non-COVID activity, such as um, planned, uh, sorry, um, predicted, um, unscheduled admissions to medicine, staff availability and external factors such as temperature and weather to generate activity scores for things like acute services, primary care and antivirus and all of our partnerships to then have a cumulative organisational threat level that can be used to direct our strategic response this, this winter. What we can do is uh, have this activity or threat level in a tiered activity response. So you might say that at threat level zero, there is no disruption. That might be what summer looks like. Um, to where we are now, three, uh, significant disruption to our services, but not at extreme levels. And each of these will have a series of very broad strategic actions that can be, then be made bespoke for each clinical service. So what have we done? Um, this is uh, our scoring template for the acute hospital and um, where we've taken data from COVID community activity, COVID hospital activity and so on, including um, unscheduled predicted admissions uh, to generate a heat map. Now this heat map takes you back eight weeks now. So we've gone back and looked at the data um, for eight weeks. And what you can see in early September, um, there was at the bottom a lot of activity in our emergency department, but very little activity at the top in our, in our COVID areas. But as September progressed, we started to get an early signal at the kind of end of 20th September week, beginning of 27th, that COVID activities were starting to rise in Dundee. This was followed by um, increasing rates in the percentage test positivity, case rises in Angus and Perth, and then admissions. And as you can see, as the ED activities fallen away into November, the activity in our COVID hospital has got um, extremely busy. We can take this to generate a, a score for our acute services and we can see how this changes over time. So the score in early September, the sum score would be at two and by the 1st of November it was at three and a half and it's starting to fall again now as our COVID activity, principally driven by a fall in community, in community cases, starts to reduce. And with that, we would be able to provide a report saying we're at uh, tiered response level three. This is what we expect the organisation to do. With this, 
we will then be able to communicate to uh, CCG level or uh, service level to say, what would you do if there was a, a tier response level three in terms of all your planned care and your staffing, so that we're able to communicate rapidly uh, to services what they need to do as activity rises and then falls and allow services to restart. And we want to do this not just in the hospital, but in, um, across primary care and in the partnerships. This will allow us to really see where activity is hot. So it might be that there's a lot of activity in, say, Angus community, which might be uh, something that prevents us discharging to that area. But then we can see how we might be able to divert services into that area effectively. And with that, what we're going to propose is what's called a flexible service delivery model or a, a hierarchy response so that you can fold in your routine or your elective work um, and your urgent work into uh, a triangle of just emergency work when, when you get to that level five, but then you can start to unfold it again in a planned tiered response. Of course, what we really want to be able to do is predict. So um, what we're working on now, um, or Sarah Lowry and Jenny Woods are, is adapting the Scottish Government modelling into a better Tayside fit and then using that with our um, data we already have in predicting admissions for medicine to start to predict a score in eight or nine days time so that we will be able to say to services we think in eight or nine days time we will see significantly less activity. Please start to plan some of your outpatient care or we can say we anticipate if we see say Covid cases, uh, COVID positivity and cases rising in the community, that again will need to step up COVID activity and perhaps step down other bits of activity. And that's the next thing. And of course, um, being able to do this using uh, AI and machine learning would be ideal. And uh, that's something that we've started speaking to health informatics about. And that would of course be incredibly exciting. As part of this, um, what we're going to do next is start to do some tabletop exercises with senior decision makers. Um, which will allow people, uh, us to almost stress test them um, and war game what might happen in, in winter under certain scenarios so that we're able to plan how we would respond and, and are our responses good, good enough. And we'll start to do that towards the end of November and early December so that as the manager says, you can train hard, fight easy. Finally, we want to communicate everything we do, um, both in, internally and externally with all of this um, activity es escalation. That's important because as a staff member myself, having to do all this, you're always asking what's happening? Why am I doing it? What am I expected to do? And what happens next? How long is this going to last? These are questions that everyone always has. And we have to be very effective at communicating this through the winter and externally to our, um, our partners in places like the fire service, police and um, uh, SAS, but also to the general public. That's what I wanted to say, really. I want to say thanks really particularly to the Core Winter team, Wendy, Susan and Christy, um, but also the business unit and public health, especially Jenny Woods, also Sarah Lowry, who worked incredibly hard on that last uh, bit of work I've shown you. I want to thank all the contributors to the Winter Plan. There are um, uh, scores of people who have contributed to what's a very large and I hope uh, useful document. But also thank everyone because um, this really is something that we're all going to have to deal with this winter. It's going to be difficult. There's lots still to be developed and um, thank everyone in advance for their hard work. Questions? Thanks very much, Dave. Um, does anyone have any questions? There's uh, one comment from Boosie saying feeding in staff absences and rotor gaps into the heat map would, be, would help the model. Yes, we're so that I, we absolutely want to do that, and um, it's just it's slightly harder getting that data actually out of HR, but um, we can definitely get it for nurses. It seems it's quite easy getting it for nursing absences. Medics is quite is a bit more difficult, but absolutely, that is I think key. Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask Dave about the winter plan or? COVID or anything? Doesn't sound like it, Dave. Just go away scot free here. Okay, so I'd just like to thank everyone for coming. Um, this will get uh, downloaded, edited, and stuck up on the YouTube channel as soon as I've got time to do it. Next week uh, would have been the DCAT annual lecture, um, but it's going to be a variation on theme as the speaker wants to come here in person. Obviously, can't do that with the restrictions. So we've got three speakers from uh, locally who are going to speak about uh, career in academic medicine, starting with an academic foundation trainee, uh, one of our registrars, and then uh, a uh, senior lecturer and consultant who are going to talk about um, 
uh, their research and how they how they've planned their their careers. And uh, Professor Ewan Pearson will chair, which saves me um, for a day. Okay, so thanks very much for coming, and uh, and I'll see you again soon. See you next week. Thanks very much.